Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Here we are in the course of uh, the fundamental principles in bioethics and within the program of bioethics at St. Thomas University. And today we're going to talk about uh, human evolution after having set some uh, background to evolution in general, how it works, the whole uh, process. So we begin as always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed Trinity, we love you, we adore you, and we thank you for all your many blessings. We ask that you uh, bless us uh, today in this lecture as we seek to delve into our human origins, phylogenetically, in other words, as a, as a species, as a whole, how did we begin and when did we begin uh, as a human species, as the image of you that we are, Lord, trying to be respectful both of the scientific data that we're finding and also of our faith or belief that you have created us in your image and likeness. We thank you for your many blessings, Lord, and at this time we pray also in a special way for those who are in most need of your divine mercy. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I hope this is recording. I see the little dot there. The microphone is right in. The only reason why I'm a little suspicious is because I have this camera, right? And in the past, I think that that blue means that it's recording, but the blue used to um, oscillate with the waves, with the sound waves, and it's not doing that now. So I don't know. But the little dot is there, this one, and I can see the microphone re reacting here. So hopefully it's recording. <laughs> okay. Now, so we have seen some basic principles about human, about evolution in general, right? The process of evolution and the the four forces, the four forces of evolution that is driving evolution. Mm -hmm. Anyone remember uh, those forces? You can tell me one of them. The four forces that drive evolution, uh, give you a hint. Uh, it has to do with, one of them has to do with DNA changing by chance. Yes. DNA changing by chance uh, through the process mostly of ultraviolet radiation. Uh, mutation, mutation, okay? So mutation is uh, basically what uh, allows for the possibility of variation in within the species, right? Variation, remember quantitative traits, there's, there are variants. Uh, of all the different phenotypes that each species has. Then the other one, at the level of the individual as a whole, when individuals are moving in and out of populations, we have migration, right? So we have mutation, migration. Then there is also a chance process, kind of parallel to the chance process of mutation. Mutation is a chance process at the biochemical level, right, at the molecular level. But there's also a chance process at the level of the organism, of the individual organism within a population. It's what we call a stochastic process, right? Which by chance, some individuals don't get to mate or reproduce or pass on their genes. They may be, uh, they may have vigor, they may have fitness, but by chance they get selected out. You know, the bug happened to pro, uh, at the time that the rock was falling from the cliff, and that was happened to be the most vigorous bug <laughs> that got killed. <laughs> so we call that drift, right? Genetic drift. Mm -hmm. So within each population, there is also drift. And then finally, in the <coughs> biggest picture, the actual process that is the one that causes evolution, if you will, that acts on on the on the phenotype, is what is called natural selection, right? Natural selection as the big process as a whole. So bottom line, we have 
mutation, migration, uh, drift, and selection. Right? Mutation, which occurs at the DNA level. It's the only time that the DNA is actually changed, right? Because the DNA is impervious. There's no going from phenotype to genotype, correct? We covered that last class on selection, uh, on adaptiveness, I'm sorry. Then they're at the level of the individual itself, different individuals within populations migrate in and out, okay? And there could be two populations of the same species, right? We can have two populations of the same species. Uh, I'll give you just an example. As you drive into St. Thomas University, you'll see that eventually there is the forest area to your left, right? There's a forest area of pine trees that are pointed out as slash pine. But if you notice, uh, even right next to the guardhouse on the right side, there's another little forest there. Both are disturbed. What do I mean by disturbed? That means it's an ecological term. It means that both of those little forests, which is the dominant species is a slash pine for the slash pine, right? Um, it's around, it's the tallest, uh, largest tree. And it is a conifer, it's a pine tree. I talked about it again uh, last time with convergent evolution. Those forests are full of invasive species from other parts of the world. By definition, an invasive species is other parts of the world. Typically, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, or even as far out as Australia with the Australian pine. Okay. They're disturbed, but they're still there. The slash pine is still the dominant tree, still the largest tree by far in those two forests. But those are technically two little populations. One is bigger than the other, okay? One is on the right hand of the road and the other one is on the left hand of the road. And they're populations for several reasons. First of all, they're actually communities, of course, but I'm focusing on the slash pine itself. It's the same species of slash pine on both sides, but those two little plots are divided by a road, okay? Excuse me. Not only the electrician, but the painters have also decided to come on Saturday to work on the building because they assumed there were no classes. <laughs> and I'm the only one teaching in the whole university on Saturdays that I know of. Okay, so those are, there are two populations of slash pine of the same species, right? Mm -hmm. But they're divided by road. And so do you think there is cross, uh, uh, activity between, there's, there's drift between those two, um, I'm sorry, migration between those two populations? Yes, there is. Even at the level of the pollen, remember we talked about prezygotic and postzygotic. Prezygotic, the pollen is one of the prezygotic uh, factors. And when that pollen comes out in mass, which is a yellow dust that covers the, the, the cars and everything else, right? And you get all the flaring of the allergies in the early springtime, mm -hmm. that those two populations are going to interchange pollen grains. And because they are the same species, but variants within each individual uh, slash pine, right? then there's a lot of uh, migration, if you will, between these two populations of, of pines, just an example. Mm -hmm. Different from drift. Drift is uh, the guy that got hit by lightning out here, <laughs> the pine tree that got hit by lightning about uh, three summers ago that I actually saw it on a, on a Wednesday morning in the summer in the middle of a downpour, got hit by lightning. Happened to be the tallest tree, so you can think that on average that was the most vigorous uh, tree uh, uh, in the uh, the most fit tree in the sector that is right behind the building and but the downside of being the tallest is that it was like a lightning rod <laughs> and it was soaking wet the whole forest was soaking wet with that downpour but it was a thunderstorm and it got hit by lightning and it was taking out it took several months for the tree to die right but eventually it died so that would have been an example of um, drift, okay? Drastic, but real. So natural selection is long-term. 
and what gets selected out is selecting out in general on average of the weakest one. But that really is at the level of population because when you talk about average, you can't really talk about an individual. The individual doesn't make an average, right? So you need a population to talk about on average. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the basic principles. And then going further back, um, we started talking about evolution and the evidence for evolution way at the beginning. What was one of the main evidence for evolution, for this process of evolution? The fossil record, right? The fossil record. And uh, then we can also look at indirectly by phylogenetics and things like that. But the bones, the, 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 or the fossil record, the, whether it's a bone or an imprint or, or an amber crystallization, you know, that is real. It's there and we have to address it and it can be uh, measured in time, dated back to hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. So that means that an animal or plant or whatever it is existed back then and is now extinct because there's nothing like it today. All right, so we're going to look at the fossil record for human evolution combined with the phylogenetics and what to do with that. And those are the two main uh, sources of evidence that will look for human uh, evolution, okay? So right here, we can look at the classification, which is still valid, the Linnaean classification of our species from Linnaeus, Carolus Linnaeus, remember? All right, he's the one that establishes this hierarchy of classification mm -hmm. down to the species level, which the name of the species also includes the genus, all right? So it's similar to a first name, last name thing. If you have siblings, well, generally we all share, my siblings uh, and I all share the same last name. We have an individual first name. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of similar to that. So here is the classification of our species, biologically speaking, and again, following the biological definition of species, which Meyer has given us, the whole issue of uh, uh, capable of reproducing and producing fertile offspring, right? So these are concepts that should resonate with you now. At the species level, we are uh, Homo sapiens, is Latin, and a little convention also while I'm at it is that the genus is always put in uh, uppercase, in capital letter, just the first letter. The first letter is capital. And then the rest, if it's going to spell out, be spelled out, it would be homo with a capital H and lowercase, the rest of the word. And then the species sapiens is always put in lowercase, okay? So that's the convention there. And there are two possibilities of doing this. It could be that, or actually I should put it the other way. Could be that, or that. Okay, either one. Now, better. <laughs> the second convention is that because it is a Latin name, right, the species name, then typically it's either underlined or in italics. All right, here I chose underlined. Uh, so it's either underlined or italics. Better, like that. <laughs> okay. And so that's a standard convention. Just for being precise. <laughs> okay. So obviously, if our species name is Homo sapiens, then our genus is Homo, right? And Homo comes from the family of the hominids. So we're typically familiar with 
domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. There are five, seven, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, yeah, because of domain. Eight. Eight levels from domain, which is the largest, the most inclusive, right? To species, which is the most exclusive, right? There are eight categories or eight levels in the hierarchy of classification in taxonomy from domain to species. Okay, so we will begin with domain, which, uh, how many domains are there? The, um, Eukarya, and then there's Prokarya, and then there is Archaea, right? Or Eukarya and Prokarya, bacteria and Archaea, but then bacteria and archaea can be grouped into um, proca uh, prokarya. So the bottom line is that each one of these categories or levels also have sub and super classifications, supra and sub. For example, when we get to the level of um, Phylum, chordate. What is uh, phylum chordate? Chordata is that we have a cord. We have a spinal cord, all right? But this doesn't determine yet that the spinal cord is segmented into what we call vertebrae. It's articulated, all right? Because there are some primitive species that don't have an articulated spinal cord, but they have a spinal cord. So that's considered the primitive internal skeleton is the spinal cord. And that's why it's called chordate because it's a reference to a cord, right? Semi-rigid cord. A further development was that that cord started to become articulated, which is what we have today as the vertebrae. So we normally refer to <coughs> the chordates, really we call them uh, vertebrates, right? And the five, groups of vertebrates, uh, which five classes of vertebrates, which are very common, very well known, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and you know the last one in the water? Come on, you've all eaten fish, right? Yes, it has a spinal cord, okay, it has spines, <laughs> internal. All right, so those five classes, right? Fish, amphibians, uh, reptiles, birds, and mammals, they're classes. So where is vertebrate? My question is, where are the vertebrates, the classification? Well, it's a subphylum. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying that all of these have sub and supra depending on the characteristic, okay? And typically, they are general adaptations for the lower group, but they are specific adaptations with regards to the higher group. You wanna think of it that way. At any rate, all I'm saying is that there are uh, other minor classifications in between these major ones. These eight are the eight major ones, all the way from domain through kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. There is one in between here that concerns us for this lecture between family and genus that we're calling tribe, tribe. Okay, now not every family really has a tribe, bless you. It's mostly on high, it's on vertebrates and higher vertebrates and mammals. So these subcategories don't always apply to all of the major categories, they don't always apply. But in this case, it does apply very much. And it's, it's an anthropological term also to talk about the tribe of hominins because and since this is a category, it's not gonna be a category of one, of one genus, let's say, to have a higher category than, than, um, than the genus, or in between family and genus, it means that there are several genera that would fall under this tribe of hominin, okay? And that's the point. Those are the fossils of the, uh, the hominins, the ones that look like humans, but they're extinct now. So we just have to go by the fossil. 
So the point here about this uh, hominin is that they are classified as a tribe, biologically and anthropologically, which means that it has several genera, one genus, several genera, represented in it. And not all of those are going to be of, um, they're all going to be of the homo line, but they're not all going to be homo sapiens, which is pointing to other hominins, okay, other homo genus that are not sapiens, but are extinct because they're not around today. Okay, the one that was closest to us, just to give a little anticipation, is Neanderthal, which coexisted with human. The most recent fossils could be 20, 30,000 years ago, which is nothing in evolutionary time in Europe. So we sapiens coincided with Neanderthal for several thousand years, mostly in Europe. And it's still debatable and uh, the jury is out, let's say, if there, was, if there was hybridization between the two, between sapiens and Neanderthal, which makes it even more interesting. Okay, and they're still looking for that fossil. But they have tissue, they have tissue from Neanderthal, not just bones, crystallized, fossilized bones, okay? They have actual, so that means DNA. So the Neanderthal genome is being mapped out. I don't know if it's finished yet or not, but Neanderthal genome. That's exciting and uh, very interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, frozen, exactly. Like the mammoth, right? Okay, so let's uh, put this a little more graphic. So this is to highlight this uh, classification of tribe, which is under family, which also points at the hominid family, hominid family, where there are going to be other hominids that are not hominin. Okay. And a little hint there, the ones, the hominids that are not going to be hominin, one of them is the paninin. And the paninin is not just an ice bread from Italy, okay, the paninin. <laughs> <laughs> the panini is from pan, the genus pan, pan troglodytes is the chimpanzee. All right, so we share the hominid with them and some other primates that we'll get into at the level of family. Okay, let's look at this. Let's put this a little bit in uh, picture, <laughs> in uh, graphic, uh, perspective. Here we go from domain to species. So hopefully these are the eight classical ones. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Most people can remember at least the first three by sequence. Domain, uh, domain is a huge territory, right? Then you get kingdoms within domains and then phylum. Phylum is a very used group. It's about 20 to 30 phyla in the world of living species between plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, etc. Well, no, bacteria will be out here. But the, the phylum is a very useful classification. Then the ones that are in between, people have difficulty remembering. As a teacher, as a professor, I think that unless there is order in the class, you can't really teach anything to the family of students, <laughs> okay? So that's a little mnemonic that I use. So there is order in the class <laughs> and not vice versa. So class is bigger than order. <laughs> anyway, then family genus species is another grouping, if you will, that is getting closer and closer. So here we have the spread of our particular hierarchy. At the level of species, we are the only species of uh, Homo that is existing today. As far as we know, we have not discovered another Homo that is not sapiens. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? Biologically, remember I also talked about the um, human population at the level of biology. How many human populations do we have in the world? How many human populations do we have in the world? Think about it. We have six or seven continents, right? We've got North America, South America. They're connected to Central America. So there's a land passage there. But then we have Europe and North America. They're not connected by land. It's, a, it's an Atlantic Ocean in between. Then we got Africa, uh, Asia, 
those, you can say that Africa, Europe, and Asia are connected by land, but then there's the Pacific Ocean in between Asia and uh, the Americas, unless you go up to the Bering Straits, Alaska, and that area there, okay? But there are huge geographical areas that are well isolated from each other, where humans uh, live and thrive all over the world. So how many human populations do we have? Go to the biological definition of population, Meyer, which is what? Two characteristics of they can, the species, right? Same species, okay? They can uh, mate and have produced fertile offspring. So what's the theory? In principle, let's say, let's choose individual humans from different parts of the world just because of their uh, geography. Let's say an African with a, uh, with a Aleut, with an Eskimo. Hypothetically, if they were to meet and fall in love and marry or not marry, do you think that biologically they could have children? Yes. Yes, and would those children, we expect those children to be fertile if they grow and survive, yes. right? Yes, hypothetically, in principle, we can imagine that. And uh, therefore, that makes them a single population, right? So the no, world, for the human, we are a single population. We are a single population, all right? And also because it points to our mobility that we can hypothetically go to any part of the world and meet any other human and, uh, and, and procreate. So we are the only one. Imagine the contrast. We are the only species that is a single population in the whole world. And imagine the contrast I'm giving you here. What's the distance between these two populations of slash pine at the entrance of our property, they're just a few hundred feet apart from each other and they're two different populations <laughs> because they're divided by road and they are plants who in principle don't have that much mobility except for their zygotes, right? Except for their, uh, their uh, pollen. And the seed, the seed dispersal also, which would be uh, post-zygotic. Okay, so Homo sapiens, single species, universal population of the whole world, okay? The only planet we know so far that can sustain us uh, uh, living. Then we go up to the level of Homo, the level of genus, and we are sharing our genus with other, you know, I had here the numbers. We're sharing the genus with other, uh, Homo species, other Homo species, but those other Homo species are extinct. The fossils no longer around, but we have the fossil record. That's what we're going to get into. At the level of hominid, we also share the family with. Um, oh, now I realize I had numbers up here and I erased them. Let me see if by chance I can rescue them. No. Hmm. Give me a minute. In another folder. Because those numbers are informative. No, I need to go to my desktop to find it. Okay, I'll do it during the break and bring it back. My apologies for this. What I had here on top of each one of the categories was the number of species or genus or family that we share with other members of that family, okay, or genus. So for example, I, here I had one on top of species, one on top of a genus, 
uh, there are several other homini homos that we share our species with based on the fossil record. And so on, as we move forward, that number obviously increases because we share our family of our family's hominid family. We share that uh, family with other genera of the hominid family. So with the order, class, phylum, the further out we go on the classification, we are sharing our species with a larger number of animals, okay? All this within the, uh, yeah, well, the kingdom of uh, animals by percentage of homology. What do I mean percentage of homology? The homology is similarity in what? The DNA. The DNA. And you can look at DNA, or we can look at the expression of DNA, which is the protein, the protein sequence. So we can establish the protein, we can determine the protein sequence, right? By blots and so forth, there are mechanisms for establishing the protein sequence, or we can look directly at the DNA. And that will give you a percentage homology. And we have the higher percentage homology with other members of the same genus. And then lower percentage homology at the level of family, lower still at the order, class, phylum, but some percentage. There will be some percentage. There will be a diminishing percentage. When we get all the way out to domain, we have some percentage homology, not only with other primates, other monkeys, other mammals, other vertebrates, other uh, animals, even a percentage homology with plants and fungi because we are all eukaryotes. In other words, we all have the nucleus, the, the uh, DNA that is contained in the nucleus. So just to give you an example, what's your intuition since at this level, at the level of eukarya, what do we have in common with all animals, all animals? Look at the photos here, right? Look at the drawings. These are all primates. These are all monkeys. But then we get into mammals. Then we get into amphibians. So this is representing vertebrates. Then we have turtles and birds, fish. These are the vertebrates here. Then other animals that are not vertebrates but they're animals, okay? So this is the, the level of animalia. Even sponges are animals. So we have some percentage homology with sponges because we're animals. <laughs> but then we go down to eukarya, we have some percentage homology with plants and fungi. And this uh, pseudo category of the protist is, this is supposed to be a paramecium. It could be an amoeba or euglena, those famous unicellular organisms, all right? What is it that we're sharing with all of these living creatures hmm, at the level of eukarya? The nucleus. nucleus, exactly, which contains the DNA functionally, right? All right. And so the nucleus structurally is made up of what? Okay. It's a bag, yeah, but you gave me too much detail. What uh, the bag is? a membrane, a nuclear membrane, which is a double membrane, like the cell membrane is also a double membrane, it's a bilayer, okay? So, and that's made up of mostly proteins, but also there's some cholesterol, there's some other uh, structures at the membrane, but it's mostly protein, okay? And, um, and the phospholipid bilayer, if these other, uh, individuals, species, groups, plants, and fungi, which are very distant from us, also have nuclei, and their membrane is made up of substantially the same substances, right? Then at the level of that homology is going to be at the level of the nuclear homology. In other words, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the lipids that are making up the protein, the, the nucleus, the membrane of the nucleus, we would find the homology at that level. Okay, 
And then also like basic metabolism. For example, one basic metabolism of all living species is respiration, right? Cellular respiration. So the pathways of cellular respiration, the PrEP cycle and all that, we would find aerobic and anaerobic, both, but mostly aerobic, all right? Which would be cellular respiration using oxygen. Anaerobic will be without using oxygen, burning basically uh, alcohol. All right, so what we have here is that at some level we share a homology with all living species on Earth. Okay, and that was really the great contribution and the great, the great insight of doing this classification, this biological classification, because at the level of phylogenetics, at the level of percentage homology, it allows us to do this phylogenetic tree. Okay, let me move forward to show you just at the level of order, the level of order, we are primates. And primates include other mm, monkey-like uh, mammals that are not human and not even monkeys, technically speaking, because this is a large, this is right under, this is right under class, right? What is the class of uh, humans? We are mammals, so right on the mammals. Okay, right on the mammals, we have order. The, we belong to the order of primates. So we can see the primates also include, in addition to monkeys, they also include things called lemurs, tarsiers, and apes, which are distinct from the monkey because the apes are the primates, um, hominids. The apes are going to be the hominids. Here are some photographs. These are the apes that I'm telling you they are the hominid, right, family. Old world monkeys. What is old world monkeys are in Africa mostly and Asia. New world monkeys, South America, Latin America, all right, Central America also. And uh, so this split happened or uh, this split happened after Pangea, right? But before Pangea, uh, before Gondwana land and Laurasia, the, the large geographical split, there was Pangea. And they were already primates in Pangea. Depending on where they were geographically after the split, then they continue to evolve separately. What I'm trying to point out is that the, the split between old world monkeys and new world monkeys had to happen uh, as Pangea broke up, okay? Because basically monkeys cannot swim the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> from Africa to South America. <laughs> All right, uh, further back, going back, there are these tarsiers, which are nocturnal. That's why they have those big, huge eyes. They're nocturnal, normally, in their behavior. And they have overdeveloped eyes in contrast to the rest of the body, and relatively large heads also in proportion to the rest of the body. So that was the big split on this side of the phylogenetic tree. If we go on the other side, an earlier split gave rise to these three main groups, the bush babies, the lorises, and the lemurs, all right? Now, what's interesting to see here is that the bush baby, which are uh, closer together phylogenetically from, from the radiation that you see here, the bush baby and the lorises are closest together, right? Because they have a common ancestor. Here's a node. And then the node with the lemurs is over here. Okay. However, 
and look at uh, the connection between the bush baby and the tarsier is way back here. Uh, this is the common ancestor of the bush baby and the tarsier, which is further back out than all the other branches of these modern contemporary um, primates. However, look how much they resemble each other. More so, bush baby resembles more a tarsier than it does a lemur. Okay? But they're further apart, phylogenetically. So, uh, my point here is that why do you think that they're so similar even though they're so distantly related? Think of habitat, right? Adaptation. Yeah, geographically, but even more locally and behavior wise, because remember, behavior is also part of adaptiveness, right? Think of the large eyes. That's the hint is the large eyes, both nocturnal. So they're inhabiting similar uh, habitats in different parts of the world because of competitive exclusion principle, right? They're inhabiting typically they're from tropical rainforest, right? And they're inhabiting similar habitats in different parts of the world. So they have developed similar phenotypes and similar behavior, which is nocturnal hunting and feeding. Hmm? Even though phylogenetically, they're as distant as you can get on the primate order. Okay, and then there's a time scale here going from 60 million years ago. The very common ancestor is considered to be anywhere between 60 to 90 million years ago. So this is a branching, right? This is a radiation that has occurred in the primates over the past, minimally, over the past 60 million years, right? Well, this is just a little review to use some of what we have been learning in phylogenetics. Let's drill down into the apes, which I'm saying are the hominids. Now we're down to the family level, right? Within class, there's order, within order, there's family. Now, our family is a family of hominids, and they're also known as the great apes, of which there are four living, four living uh, genera of family, because what's on their family? Genus, right? So four genera, and they are the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimp, and the humans. These are the hominids biologically speaking, according to our DNA, and that's the percentage homology. So you can see it's a very tight homology. We share 97% of our DNA sequence with the orangutan. Now that's the entire genome, okay, which includes the junk, <laughs> which is 97% of, on average, I don't know actually what it is, but I suspect that it's about 97% for the, for the orangutan also within its own genome, okay? So it's only about 3% that is coding, the 20,000 proteins, more or less the 20,000 genes, not proteins, genes that uh, make up the coding region of the human. 98% with the gorilla and 99% with the chimp. I chose this photo on purpose because the chimp is, has what on its hand? A tool. It's not just carrying that rock because it wants to get weighed down. <laughs> it's gonna use that rock for something. <laughs> so it's using a tool, all right? Different from manufacturing a tool. <laughs> but using the tool, yes. Okay. 
let's go uh, forward then. So this is percentage homology. As you can see, it's pretty high, significant. And that makes us part of the hominids, biologically speaking, just on the DNA. Now let's look at the divergence. It is estimated that we diverge from the other great apes uh, between uh, five and eight million years ago. Been downloaded down more to between six and seven million years ago, but the broad range is five to eight, the narrow range is six to seven. We would need more fossils to be able to narrow this down. Okay. But if you want the broad range, five to eight, the narrow range, six to seven million years ago, is what we can call the big divergence between the Homini tribe and the Gorillini tribe. And so you see that this divergence separates us from the chimp and the gorilla and further out would have been the one with the uh, orangutan. But this is the one that is most concerned, the percentage homology. So when we say, well, did we derive from the chimp or did the chimp derive from us? Neither one, because our divergence happened between six and seven million years ago, okay? So we cannot have contemporary ancestors. But on the Homini line, which we're focusing on, you can see all the fossil record that we have. And there are fragments of skulls, other parts of the body also, other bones of the body, but the skull or fragments of the head are very telling. It could be a jaw, it could be a fragment of a jaw, it could be a series of teeth, molars. Uh, if they're found together, then that is uh, a great richness of information. And typically these fragments are found with other artifacts, other what is known as material culture, material culture, pieces of burned wood, which could have been from the campfire, and maybe a fossil of the animal they were eating and so forth. Okay, so it's all very informative. Okay, we're still concentrating on the phylogenetics here of the split and the fossil record that supports that split. Because of course, at this point, we don't have the DNA of the ancestors, right? Only when we get to uh, Neanderthal here. Okay, so uh, this lecture is based mostly on a book by Barton and uh, co-authors. It's just called Evolution from 2007. This is one of the diagrams in the, one of the figures in the textbook. And now we are in the hominin, that hominin tribe that I spoke of, the hominin tribe. It has a major split into two, what is known as the Australopithecines. The Australopithecines are uh, the southern apes, the southern apes. That's where Lucy is, that famous little fossil of uh, Lucy which is an almost intact uh, skeleton, uh, bipedal, very significant, and with uh, prints also on the mud. Anyway, it starts back here with this Artipithecus. Pithecus or Pithecus, uh, however you want to pronounce it, is a reference to ape, the P, Pithecus, okay, the ape, that's where we get the, the word ape comes from Pithecus, which is a reference to uh, apes. Australo, Australo is a reference to the south. So these are southern apes. These are fossils that have been found 
mostly in Africa, but also in Asia, in generally south of the equator. So the reference to as uh, southern apes. Here is the big split between Homo and the Australopithecus. Some hypothetical Homo uh, genus that has not been found yet. So hypothetical. But these fossils, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, have definitely a Homo characteristics in the genus Homo. Okay, so these fossils, what I'm trying to say is that the fossils of Habilis and Rudolfensis are significantly different from the Australopithecines to justify another genus that is not Australopithecus, all right, it's not Epithecus, it is a Homo. So here is, this is a significant split into the Homo genus, into the genus Homo. And it goes back to about two and a half million years ago. So basically the split with the other great apes for the hominin tribe happened about five to six million years ago. And then the further split within the hominin tribe into the Homo, into the genus Homo, happened according to the fossil record that we have today about two and a half million years ago. So it's getting to be very recently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, these hominins at the tribe level, they were already bipedal, which is the big split with the other great apes, meaning the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. And I'll talk about knuckle walking a little bit further down. But for now, staying with the big picture, without getting into the details, just the chronology. The split in the hominin tribe from the other great apes about six to five million years ago. And the split with the southern apes at the genus level about two and a half million years ago. And since then, we have about at least half a dozen fossils that are all homo. They're all within our genus, okay? But different species. Because we, are, we sapiens are the only species, we believe, you know, very, they're the most, we are the most recent, that's another way of looking at it, we're the most recent species of the genus homo in a line that can be traced back to about two and a half million years ago. And we have, like I say, about half a dozen fossil records here of different spe Homo species, right? Habilis, Rudolfensis, Ergaster, Erectus, Heidelbergensis from Heidelberg in Germany. Some of these references are to the place where they were found. Other references are to the lifestyles that uh, we think they lived like for example, Neanderthalus, which is the most recent split from us. Okay, let's drill a little further in. Let's look first at the other hominins, which are Australopithecus, the, Australo the southern apes, the Australopithecines, and this is their fossil record dating anywhere from about 7 million years ago to about 2 million years ago, the span. This is their uh, genus, but they're all Australopithecines, they're all southern apes. Sahelanthropus, a reference to the Sahel. What is the Sahel? is the border of the Sahara Desert with the tropical rainforest in Southern Africa or, or Central Africa actually at the equator. We'll see a map uh, in a little bit. Basically the Sahel is the boundary between the Sahara and the tropical rainforest. 
which is expanding, the Sahara Desert is expanding into the tropical rainforest over time. So there's a desertification process going on. And that boundary is called the Sahel. Okay, so Sahelanthropus, Sahel is a reference to where they were found in that boundary region. Anthropus is a reference to uh, that they're anthropoid, they're human-like. Anthropoid is that they are human-like. This is a fossil. This is a reconstruction, which is done very, very meticulously with experts in anatomy and physiology and uh, anthropology, all the different fields that specialize in the reconstruction of fossils. And they start first to reconstruct the fragment of the fossil into a complete skull. This is all done by computer, of course. They reconstruct this, they finish the model, if you will, with a computer modeling into a complete skull. And then based off what we know today of anatomy and physiology, from the skull, they start layering the tissues. They would layer first uh, the muscles and the conjunctive tissue and so forth and work from the inside out as if they were building you know, a human or any other species. And so you can see that several different uh, specialty fields feed into the reconstructing of this model all the way out to the outer layer of anybody's body, which is going to be the skin and all its appendages and all its um, organs uh, like the hair, glands and so forth. Uh, so this is the reconstruction, all right? you would almost think it's a photograph. Well, it's a photograph of the reconstruction, but it's very detailed. Yeah, it is, it's very, very real. Uh, and you can see how all the different fields fit in as the teeth structures are reconstructed from the jaw shape, for example, they can tell how many molars they had, how many canines and how many incisors, all those different shapes of tree, of, of teeth, represent different functions, right? Of grinding, cutting, tearing, etc. So that's getting at their feeding habits. Basically, they were what we call heterodonts. In other words, a variety of different shapes of trees. So we fed, uh, we feed on a variety of animals and plants and whatever doesn't eat us, we eat it. <laughs> okay, and so it's a, it's a variety, a variety. That then can estimate where, together with where they were living, the ecology and try to reconstruct the ecosystem in which they were living. Mm -hmm. Ardipithecus, uh, again, starting with a fossil record of a skull, fragmented skull, reconstructed. This is what they uh, are supposed to look like. And then Australopithecines, here we go. This is more closer to us. Uh, just uh, at the split. Again, the fossil and the reconstruction of that fossil, and then the model. If we look at them, just a first impression, they have a human-like uh, look, right? They have a human-like look, anthropoid, mm -hmm. but they're still apes, mm -hmm. and they're also extinct. So these are all uh, hypothetical. It's amazing what can be done with a computer and expertise, huh? Just amazing. And of course, the head implies also a body underneath that neck for the whole length. Mm -hmm. One common characteristic, all bipedal, bipedal, mm -hmm. because they're hominin. Bipedal, yes. Uh, let me see, it should open, yeah. Let me open, uh, let's see, I can do this. Okay, so I'll put it in the handout, just add it to the handout, so then when I send it to you, you'll have it integrated, okay? So as I do that, give me a moment to pull up the handout, here we go. I sent it out already, but the one I'll send now will have incorporated the words as we go along with, and, and thank you, because whenever there is a word that uh, you're unsure on the spelling, just Ask me and I'll include it here. Okay. Uh, some key words. Well, 
it's actually further down, okay, but uh, bipedal since it came up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Fully yeah. 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 fully bipedal. It's it is in the head at further down. Is that big enough? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll put keywords there. I said that um, PC scene is uh, ape, it's a reference to ape, and Alo <coughs> is a reference to southern, right? For example, Australia is a southern place. <laughs> That's we get Australia. Okay. Here we are. Let's look at another little phylogenetic tree of the fossils on the hominin line now. See, we're going on the homo. So first, look at this little uh, wording I have, this little paragraph. Hominins include Australopithecines and homo, right? Here, I was, uh, sorry. Here I was reeling on the Australopithecine, that other branch of our distant uh, Relatives, now here I'm drilling on the homo, on the genus homo, all right? Fossil record, like I mentioned, about a, a dozen of them. Going back, oops, two and a half million years ago, more or less, the split, homo habilis and homo rudolfensis. Sometimes, Okay, so the names can have at the, at the species level. At the species level, the name can be one of uh, three main categories. It could be, for example, the region where they were found. Mm -hmm. Australopithecus uh, africanus was found in Africa. <laughs> uh, or it could be the um, function that we think they had, right? The function, Homo habilis. Homo habilis was very dexterous with uh, their hands. They were able to do things. I will get the word able, all right? Or the third category of uh, species uh, naming is the ego of the scientist who found the fossil. <laughs> their last name, or sometimes even their first name, but <laughs> the last name. So I suspect that this rural fences was a reference to Rudolf. <laughs> okay. Ergaster means that becoming erect, becoming, uh, or no, emerging. Ergaster is a reference to emerging. Here is their function in the phylogenetic tree. Ergaster, it is emerging. Okay. Erectus is a reference, obviously, to the upright uh, position, posture, right? Antecessor is a reference to someone that's coming. <laughs> Heidelbergensis is a reference to Heidelberg. It's a town in uh, Germany today where the fossil was found. Heidelberg, which is significant because this is kind of Northern Europe, mm -hmm. pretty far away from Africa, the original uh, source. Neanderthalis, mm -hmm. reference to its uh, primitiveness compared to us. <laughs> And sapiens is a reference to what we're supposed to know, <laughs> right? To the fact that we know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we're capable of uh, wisdom sometimes. <laughs> okay, so you see here at least uh, half a dozen of these fossils lining up in their chronology and also in their uh, geography, which is not shown here on this map only the chronology, but there is also a radiating out from Africa originally through uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, eventually into Asia, also India, and also Europe, and then finally uh, the Americas through the Iberian, uh, this, through the, uh, um, uh, the Straits, uh, what's that called, the Straits up in Alaska. Here are the fossils and the reconstruction. 
Habilis, Rudolfensis, Ergaster, etc. Okay. And their chronology from two and a half, two million years ago up until 40,000 years ago when we coincided with Neanderthal. Okay, the sapiens is not shown here because these are only fossils. And then I just have here a reference 200,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago is considered anatomically modern man. In other words, if we saw a man or a woman of 200,000 years ago, which obviously they're not living today, right? If we saw them well shaped and well dressed and made up, we wouldn't be able to distinguish them from any one of us. That's what it means anatomically modern man. Mm -hmm. Pretty striking. 200 million years ago. So look at, you know, it, it goes back into here and also coincides with Heidelbergensis. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we were to shave and groom and dress up Heidelbergensis and Neanderthal the way they're presented? I can think of some humans that look similar to this. <laughs> yes. Right? You know, I mean, I'm sorry I'm being grotesque maybe, but uh, you can think about it. And there's a similarity. There's a striking similarity. Now, this is just a phenotype. This is the anatomy. Okay? We still have to look at the physiology. We still have to look at the behavior. And most importantly, will they reproduce for all offspring if they were to mate with Homo sapiens? That's a big question, which will remain a question forever because these are all fossils. <laughs> These are all extinct. Okay. But there is, like I say, it's an open question if there was some hybridization with Neanderthal in Europe, as we coincided from, uh, for about uh, 20 to, we coincided for about 40,000 years, the Sapiens and the Neanderthals in Europe. Okay. Well, it I is. Have a yes. All of these, uh, are for male? Can we distinguish Good question. A short question. I don't know because uh, I'm not an anthropologist, but perhaps uh, I don't know if, uh, Doctor, you have any idea if a male or female skull human? They're, they're the no, same. they're about the same. They're the yeah, same. yeah, the same. Yeah, anatomically, there's going to be variants, and I'm going to show you variants on the human skull but I suspect we'll find the same variants. Again, thinking out loud here, because you got me thinking now, and we do have what is called moderate dimorphism, right, between men and women today in the human species. is moderate, but it's real, substantially, can be measured statistically. And so the average, I think for women, the average height is, what, about five, maybe five, four or something like that and the average height for men is about five seven i'm just guessing but five eight i say five eight okay so we're talking about maybe four inches more or less on average four inches and it's significant because you know that's a very robust number when we talk about the human population we're talking about seven billion people plus on average half and half so that's extremely robust number for of course not everyone has been measured <laughs> okay we're talking about sample of that but that, even that sample, I would suspect, is robust. So if the height, but then again, again, I'm just thinking out loud here with you, uh, you're asking of if there is a anatomical difference between the male and the female skull, the human and male and female skull. And the first thing that came to mind, well, could we find a difference in the dimorphism, you know, of, of height? But then... Again, that difference is going to be which is the bone that contributes mostly to our height? The femur, not the skull. So, and then as far as I know, there's no dimorphism on the, in the human male and female brain, <laughs> which is functionally what is pushing the skull, right? What is making the skull to be a particular size and shape is the, is the brain. And 13, 50, 
cubic centimeters, which number we're going to get to in a minute, I think is across, there is no difference between the male and the female brain, at least anatomically and for weight, right? And so we're not going to find a difference in the skull necessarily. Feeding habits, I'm thinking of the jaw functionally, what could drive the jaw, the male and female jaw to be different? That's a question for a dentist or orthodontist. Uh, the, main, the main difference is in the pelvic bone. The pelvic, of course, yeah, because of birthing or not birthing, <laughs> exactly. exactly. So round or triangular mm -hmm. shape or uh, pyramidal shape, yes, that's the main. Like found a fossil of a pelvic so, to, to sell whether yes. it's a female or a male. Female or male, yeah, and that one is definitely, in fact, there's a movie where, <laughs> there's a famous movie where the lawyer is using the skeleton of uh, the victim to point something out and so forth. And he's it's a female victim, or in the movie, the, the victim is a female, and he's got a male skeleton <laughs> projecting, you know. <laughs> it's, we have to call it artistic license <laughs> or Hollywood ignorance. <laughs> but you can tell from the pelvic bone that uh, it was a male and not a female. But that's about it, really. Uh, okay. Therefore, at the level of skull, no, I don't think we can tell. Maybe back then, but then who knows? Because again, we're going on fossils, and that's the other thing that it's another point that I'm going to make on variation. Uh, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but um, what tells me that this fossil is representative of these Homo habilis? You know, this could be, it's definitely a variant because there's going to be variation on any species, on any phenotype, there's going to be variation. The variation may be tight or broad, depending on the tails of, think of a normalized curve, a Gaussian curve, bell-shaped curve, right? It's got, the bell is gonna be narrow, tight, for little variation, or broad for large variation, okay? Uh, for example, uh, what is your intuition on human brain size at the same age the same because we have to put it by age right because uh, the organs are growing the same age uh, the suspicion is that the variation is going to be fairly tight compared to for example skin color we have a very broad skin color uh, on the human species all right but brain size brain capacity or cranial capacity still has to hold 1,350 cubic cc's. So I suspect that that uh, trait is going to be much narrower around the mean. Just to give an example. But there's always a variation. There's always variation on the phenotypes. So what tells us that this variant is representative of the species or is out on the peripheries? It's anybody's guess. Unless we find a second and a third and we start comparing them and seeing how much range of variation there is, we're still just left with a single fossil, which we're calling representative, but who knows? We have to put a variation around the mean. And who's to tell me that this guy is actually at the center of the mean? Could be, but that's kind of lucky, you know. Most likely, it's going to be some variation of the mean. But we're using it as if it were the mean, as representative. So again, with our mind's eye, we have to see this, we have to see variants of this guy, of this phenotype to be, and the variant that is concerning us here for the purpose of this course is more ape-like or more human-like. That's going to be the variant that is relevant to us, significant to us, because at the end of the day, what I want to do is at some point, posit the possibility of a soul on any one of these, which would take us then to eternal life and to God's image and so forth. And that's our segue, that's our connection with our faith, with the Christian faith and, and just faith in general of an afterlife, okay? Which points to me also that we're gonna, what would be even more telling that the phenotype is gonna be their behavior. For example, give you a hint, did they bury their dead? We don't see any animal, even chimps don't bury their dead. And they're 99% compatible at the DNA level. Why bury a dead? <laughs> okay. See? Another one, clothing. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, here's a, a spread from 2 million years ago to 40,000 years ago. And you can see the resemblance, but also the, the greater and greater resemblance in general toward more human-like and less ape-like, all right? This guy is looking more Australopithecus than uh, our Neanderthal friend here. The skulls, now by, now I'm gonna look at the skull functionally. What do I mean by the skull functionally? The skull and its function, what is the function of the, the skull? Brain. Exactly, to house the brain, all right? So when we see the skull indirectly, we can determine the volume of that brain. And determining the volume of the brain indirectly, we can determine also uh, smartness or capacity for higher thinking power all the way up to abstract thought eventually, which is what we have. All right, so here's the split of the panini. Remember I said that pan, pan troglodytes is the chimp. Let me write that guy down. That's the modern chimp. And Z. And pro. So if I want to be true to what I just said, we we'll have to write it that way, and then I would have to do one more thing to it, which is what? Either italicize it or underline, underline it. <laughs> Just being picky. There. Okay. All right, so the divergence between the panini, the chimp-like creatures, and the hominin, uh, human-like creatures, goes back five to eight million years ago. You can narrow it down to between six and seven. Uh, and here is uh, a skull. Now this is a modern skull, so we have to be careful. We're kind of cheating here, but the modern chimp, the modern pan, has 400 cubic centimeter. It's that guy there. The break, you can take a look at our, the one we share a common ancestor with, the closest one we share a common ancestor with, who is living today. 400 cubic centimeters. Now, fossils. Australopithecines, in other words, southern apes, divergence between three and four million years ago, divergence with us, with, with uh, Homo sapiens, okay? It's uh, 450, so there's a beginning of an increase, but who's to say that this is representative? She could have been extremely smart, you know, she could have been a variant <laughs> way out there, an outlier. We have to assume that on average, you know, this is all we have to go by. I think now there have been a few other fossils found of Lucy-like uh, uh, creatures, Australopithecines, but this one was very famous, it was a few years ago. Have you ever heard of Lucy? Yeah, some of you have. Uh, she was very famous when she was discovered. This uh, little skeleton like that is about, she's about half her size. There we go. That's what was found. So from that, reconstruct a whole creature. Well, actually an anthropologist and a bone person will tell you, wow, I have a lot to go on. <laughs> I have a lot to go on. I got part of the skull, I got part of the jaw, I got part of the chest, I got part of the limbs, I got part of the hip, I got part of the legs. I have a lot, to, I even have a femur, wow, I have a lot to go on. <laughs> yeah, for us I say, <laughs> this is hopeless, there's <laughs> nothing I can do with this. All right, but look, here's the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, then here is 
trying to place her halfway in between uh, <laughs> uh, us and them. But of course, there's anachronism here, big time, right? Exactly. The anachronism. What is the anachronism? What do I mean by anachronism? Meaning that it's obsequent. It's like seeing it's like uh, seeing a Roman soldier smoking a cigarette or something like that, right. or, or using a gun instead of a sword. Out of synchrony. Out of synchrony. It doesn't belong there. It's out of chronology. Mm -hmm. Outside of chronology, right? She's outside of chronology because we are contemporaries to the chimp, but she goes back three to four million years ago. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. However, in justice to this diagram, what it's trying to show is the bipedalism, bipedalism that even though Lucy had longer forearms, more ape-like forearms, Okay, she already has the full construction of the foot for bipedalism and the displacement of the hip. You see the displacements of the hip more horizontally as opposed to pan, which is more vertical, which points to really the culprit in all this is the spinal cord, which I'm sad it wasn't shown because it would be interesting to see. We have an S-shaped spinal cord which allows us to balance right on top of the hip, whereas Pan only has a curved, a single curve. So he has to go down on his forward limbs periodically. Can walk for a while, but eventually has to go down on the forward limbs. It's called knuckle walking, and it's one of my slides further on. But since we got into Lucy, there is the bipedalism that it's trying to show. Let me out of here, see if it shows other aspects. Oh, here we go. Let me see if this one shows the spine. Yeah, I think I see. So Lucy was yes. completely bipedal? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, and part of- out of chronology, well, because she's like extinct a, now. Right. You know, what I'm saying by out of chronology, sorry, I always do this. <laughs> by, I mean, what, what I mean by out of chronology is in this uh, diagram here. I can make this go this way. No. <laughs> I, let me get back to the diagram here. Oops. <laughs> there, you, there you go. <laughs> Yes, fully bipedal. Mm -hmm. Yes, but look at the high cheekbones. Wow, I'm gonna keep this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> amazing, huh? Yes, yes. This is obviously a computer model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I mean, anachronistic is that of course uh this is going to get into something else <laughs> first let me make this a little smaller so i don't know where i am now here what i mean by anachronistic is that we have two contemporary species here and we have an extinct species for millions of years so we have to be careful not to go across too much like this because these are contemporary skeletons, but this is a fossil skeleton. <coughs> so it would be better to look at the answer when the divergence occurred, you know, between hominin and, uh, and paninin, and then compare Lucy to that ancestor. In other words, Lucy is an ancestor to humans. It would be interesting to see the ancestors of Pan and how far back we can go with the fossil record of Pan and match it up with Lucy. That would be a more, mm, more relevable, yes. Try to put it in its own chronology. Right. In other words, again, kind of thinking out loud here, if Lucy goes back to two to three million years ago, find a Pan fossil 
of two to three million years ago since the divergence was at six million and compare those two fossils to see whether, I, you know, that's more apples to apples. <laughs> mm -hmm. But here they're trying to make the case that she's a transition, but she's definitely on the hominid line. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, it's it, fascinating that she was bipedal. Yeah. Bipedal yeah. and yeah. Australopithecus. Yeah. Right. So she's not in the Homo genus. She's right. in the uh, she's Australopithecus. Uh -huh. Again, what are we saying by this? All this to say that bipedalism is not unique to the Homos, mm -hmm. to the Homo genus. It also is is unique to the hominin but also Australopithecines, at least some Australopithecines were also bipedal. Okay, so it predates, it's not, we cannot, we cannot own that characteristic as uniquely ours. Mm -hmm. But there was a synergy that occurred with bipedalism and, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, probably in the second part of the lecture. Okay, so now I have a little link here I wanna save. <laughs> So, sorry for the work in progress. This is a good thing about graduate school that we can do these things as we go along. All right, and save. Because these are also exploratory courses, right? So, Lucy, the Australopithecines, already bipedalism. And it's not that significant, the brain uh, amplification, the brain gain is not that significant. It's just a little over 10% on average. And that's assuming that uh, here, Lucy Australopithecus africanus is representing her species. You know, she's in the, no she's in the middle of the norm, <laughs> which we don't know. Okay, uh, move down a little further in, oh, no, cross over to the genus Homo. All right, he, uh, to Homo. Habilis is the oldest one we have. It's already a little more significant, 550 cc's gain, at least from this fossil record, which we're assuming is representative. Mm -hmm. But you see 150 out of 400 is about 30%. 25% increase, right? It's becoming significant. Going further down to Erectus. Now here's the big jump. From 550 to 1000 CC, almost 200%, right? Doubling, almost doubling the brain size. And you can see it's very evident, the cranium size, look at that. Here's Habilis, here's Erectus. And the time span, not that big. From 2.5 to 1.8 million years ago, right? Less than a million years. 0.7, what is this? Uh, it's a 0 0.7, 700,000 years. Less than a million, 700,000 years. Double the brain size. Is that one of the factors because they can use their hands because never The synergy, the hand-brain synergy, okay? The hand brain synergy. So you can see because that. In the brain, because of the, the arm, then the hand has to be a representation, like the tongue. Yes. And in the brain, it's, it takes a bigger mass. Mapping, mapping on the brain, yes, on the map, on the uh, cortex, right? Mm -hmm. There you go, yes. And so there's a synergy, there's a, it's, uh, it's a selecting on that. Right. <laughs> okay, that is definitely a selective advantage. The larger brain map of dexterity of the hands on the on the cortex all right so great it's always great to have doctors in the class because <laughs> you enhance <laughs> the, 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 the clinical the anatomical part all right so here we go look at this from the split time of let's put it at six million for the sake of argument six million years ago to two million years ago we increase our brain increase or our ancestors brain increase let me talk properly our ancestors brain increase merely 20 15 percent 20 percent from 400 to 550 cc uh, cubic uh, centimeters and then in less than one million years 700 thousand years 
it doubled its brain capacity. Something happened, and it happened in Africa, in Equatorial Africa, that made this jump. We were already bipedal here, okay, with, with uh, Lucy. But here, something happened that significantly selected on brain size, okay? And the assumption is that it's associated with the dexterity of the hands, but also fleeing predators and catching prey. And what's that? Catching prey, catching prey. Yeah, but still we had a fairly hunter-gatherer, so we would just eat about anything that wouldn't kill us. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so here we are with Homo erectus at a thousand cubic centimeters. Neanderthal, another 1,500 years, uh, sorry, uh, another million years, at least a million years, a little bit more than a million, a million three. 50% uh, gain to 1,500. And even what's paradoxical is that Neanderthal had a, a larger brain capacity than we do. That's sapiens, okay? We're at 1,350. And again, this is a robust number because of the millions of people that have been measured or skulls, <laughs> human skulls. So this is, and yet, the theory is that we wiped out Neanderthal. It was a competitive exclusion principle in Europe, uh, hunting and gathering the same prey, and we essentially hunted them out, all right? That's the theory. So what does that mean? That there was a limit to the ability to grow brain, all right, bless you. Apparently 1350 was enough of a brain to exclude a 1500 cranium species. <laughs> so what they're saying here is that brain size is an advantage, but to a limit. And then beyond that limit, apparently it was not an advantage. It was not a further advantage to survive because if this had been open-ended, uh, uh, you would have think you would have thought that the Neanderthal would have wiped out the sapiens back then simply by having a bigger brain and bigger, larger body, more bulk uh, mass anyway. But it didn't. So somehow we were more agile than the Neanderthal enough to wipe them out. Okay. In other words, the extinction of Neanderthal is not considered to be by any other prey or climatological change or anything, but by man. Is this that is like basic. something that you know for sure is a theory? It's a theory, and it will remain a theory forever because we have to go on the fossil record, we have to go on the material culture that has been found, their campsites, uh, their, their clan uh, settlements, and things like that. Right. At the same time, Yes, yes, yes. We coincided for about 4,000 years. We did, in Europe specifically. That's what I was trying to point out here. Let me go back to here for a moment. See, Neanderthal began around 600,000 years ago. This is a million, all right? So the whole number is a million. And the first decimal is hundreds of thousands. So Neanderthal arose as a species, estimated, this is estimated for sure, about 600,000 years ago, and was extinct about 40,000 years ago, all right? Whereas we started 200,000 years ago and are still present today, so we coincided for this much. But as a species, but in C2, in the same place, it's a different story, okay? Because eventually we coincided uh, in Europe, and there's plenty of evidence for that in campsites and stuff, and that's where, that was like the last stand of the Neanderthal was Europe, okay? And it's considered to be a combination between the ice age, uh, the glacial periods coming in and out of Europe, and uh, sapiens dexterity, more dexterity to deal with those climatological changes 
and some actual open confrontation that happens, some actual wars or, or fights. Social, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, which points out that if there was hybridization, it was not that successful because we could have blended in instead, you know, and become a new species that would have would have been a better species, let's say, more adapted, would have replaced both Neanderthal and Sapiens, this hypothetical blend. But no, apparently the genome was diverse enough that those hybrids, if they were hybrids, were not successful, were not um, fertile. Uh, okay, so those were dead ends. Uh, so there was more aggressivity than there was cooperation, <laughs> we can say. Mm -hmm. They didn't get along. <laughs> exactly. And so we've seen, we have examples of that in the rest of nature with what, what uh, we were calling the competitive exclusion principle, remember? And it was an example of birds, two different species of birds coming to the same tree, going for the same resources. Basically, we like the mammal for something like that, and they liked it too. All right, uh, the easier prey, larger mammals, was probably the best feed for a cold climate uh, uh, Europe during the glacial and interglacial periods. And so we were competing for the same resources, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see the score progression here allows us to tell the brain capacity. But then what I wanted to point out, the little caveat with this, is variation on the skull size because we are estimating, we're extrapolating the brain volume according to the size of the skull. But these are CTs, these are computer tomographs of contemporary skulls, human skulls, all right? And you can see the variety, you can see the variation on the skull, right? For example, this one has a very narrow skull. This one has a very wide, intermediate. This has kind of a sad face. <laughs> you know, look at the orbits, the orientation the of the orbits, the, orbit. the shapes, uh, diagonally pointing down. These are kind of horizontal. Uh, also, the acceptable region, the foramen, the hole into the spinal cord. All right, look at the jaw, uh, the mandible, projection, whereas no projection, strong projection, the, 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 uh, the cheekbones, look at the variation in cheekbone, okay? So all this to say that in the human skull, there is variation about the mean. So what is to say that these, oh, sorry, these skulls that we're looking at from fossils are representatives. There are definitely variants, but you don't know how close they are to the mean back then. Having said that, also the number, the actual number of individuals makes a difference too, you know, how, how representative a single skull is, because it, it makes a difference if we have a skull of a, a human skull today representing seven billion people that we are, as opposed to, let's say, Lucy, all right, uh, that uh, maybe there were a few thousand or a few hundred individuals back then. And so this goal is going to be more representative because the population was very small. And it would, the population could have been in the thousands or maybe even just hundreds that particular population that this individual belonged to. Okay, so these are all caveats. Uh, when we look at these reconstructions, we have to understand that these are representative, but we don't know exactly how representative they are of the population as a whole or the species as a whole. Okay, uh, I'm probably gonna stop after this slide because then we're going to get into material culture that has been found on the hominid line, on the homo line. I'm drilling in on the homo. A, a further um, synergy 
Oh no, synergy is not the word. Further development. Further development in the homo genus, okay, occurred between uh, in the last 100,000 years. The last 100,000. So we saw already that there was a big jump. I'll go back here for a moment. Between Habilis and Erectus was double in the brain size. That was between 2.5 and 1.8 million years. And then the size grew less proportionally to the, to the chronology, to the time. But then, 100,000 years ago, there was a greater development on the fossil record, and all these points represent fossils, individual fossils, that have been timed. These are all on the HOMO line, all right? There's a correlation with what is known as technical culture or using the use of tools and also harnessing, harnessing fire, mm -hmm. using tools and fire, technological culture, and then innovation going from use to make, to making tools, for example. All right, that's innovation. And we can see there that the curve takes off into a log phase. And that's the log phase that we're on right now with technology, where you can think just in the past 100 years, for example, think of the beginning of the 1900s. Some of us still remember the phone, right? <laughs> the real phone, which is a plastic box with a handle on it and wires and the dial. Okay? Nothing like a cell phone today. And even back 100 years ago, barely we were harnessing electricity and the car and all this. Now we got rovers, we got jeeps going around Mars, two jeeps going around another planet mm -hmm. and taking photographs and sending those over here and then reconstructing them by computer modeling. So the technology has just uh, taken off exponentially and that's the exponential curve that we're on here. Okay. This is a CC measurement, cubic centimeters of uh, brain capacity to the present, which we would be here. So, I guess these would be outliers. Uh, I'm trying to find the legend, okay, yes. So the open, the, um, the white circle is uh, humans, and this is a range that we can see here, it's interesting. So this gives us a range all the way from uh, just a little above a thousand cc's to all the way up to 1850 more or less, beyond 1800 cc's. These are obviously the two outliers on the curve, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone else in between, hovering around 1300. So it looks, this curve looks to be skewed just from the points here. Here's 1350 for the human. So I don't know in detail why this curve, uh, all these points are to the right of the average, but they're definitely to the right. Okay, just interesting. Because here's the, here is the average, 1350. Anyway, the solid circles, oh, sorry, excuse me, excuse me for a moment. Think about the uh, 
<laughs> Sorry about that. I was the other professor. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so what is interesting about this curve in the big picture is this log phase. All right. First is a lag phase, which is very typical of, uh, let's say, population growth, right? It starts in a lag phase, meaning slowly. And then it picks up, remember when we saw population growth curves? And it goes into a log phase, which is pointing out to some kind of synergism going on. And the synergism is precisely between the brain and the hands, the dexterity of the hands. Okay. All right, and then it's correlating. These, are, these lines are correlations to fossil groups that they have found. For example, the solid circle is Neanderthal, which is the closest to us. And then let's see what is next to that is here the square, solid square. Okay, uh, Helme is another, Homo Helme is another uh, fossil that has been found um, in Africa. Triangular, Homo erectus. Here's Homo erectus, and they've tried to do some convergence lines on them. See slopes, how they're moving in this general direction, positive slopes. But then with the Neanderthal, there is this negative slope indicating that the capacity, the brain capacity of Neanderthal was not necessarily a survival advantage to the brain capacity of the human. So that's the name. That's the 1500 CC there compared to the 1350 is that uh, negative slope. Okay, all the other slopes are positive, but, and then you can also see a trend if we take, now these are computer models, so we have to take them with a grain of salt, uh, see how robust the data is and so forth. They're all based on fossil records of skulls and so forth. But you can see that generally the slopes tend to be steeper here and then they slow down, but it's still positive. And now there is this negative slope with the most recent common ancestor. And therefore we can say, we can intuit from this that perhaps Homo, the genus Homo has reached its most advantageous brain capacity, okay? Uh, it could be other capacities by way of behavior or everything else, but basically, to me, to give you a crude analogy, it's like, you know, we have now this supercomputer, and we're not really exploiting all of the capacities of the supercomputer, so the selective pressure is off for making the supercomputer better until we actually exhaust the capacities of the supercomputer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is kind of a uh, summary so far, and we're gonna take a break in a minute. The only living species of hominins is a sapiens, but we have evidence from the fossil record uh, of at least six distinct, uh, an extinct, distinct, an extinct, excuse me, uh, homo species. The main hominin characteristic is fully bipedal, which, as I'm saying, generates that um, synergy between the hand and the brain to become more dexterous and to push the brain to be more innovative, more creative in using the hands. At the behavioral level, well, biological, the increased brain size. At the behavioral, two main things, two main characteristics, making tools beyond using a tool, which we have evidence of other animals using tools, but actually making tools. We only see that so far in the Homo line, right? In the uh, genus Homo, making tools. And then using fire also. Other species, what do other species do with fire? They run away as fast as they can. All right. 
the homo, we have evidence from the record that they were intrepid enough, they were, they were mm, smart enough, primitive humans to get close to fire instead of running away from it and to be curious about it. You know, it's like curiosity was above the fear. <laughs> enough to grab a little something on that fire and try to harness it and analyze and see why, what good can I make out of this great evil, all right? What good can I make out of it? And the big good that they made out of it was essentially cooking, cooking, which pre-digests the food, starts digesting the food, which enables us to profit more from the stuff that we hunted or gathered, all right, especially the hunting. So it makes, it synergizes with a hunting, the fact that now we, we can get more nutrition out of the hunted animal. And mm -hmm. also staying warm. Yes, the warm, the, the shelter that, and then, yeah, that's another thing that the protection that it offered uh, to keep away other predators that would be scared by it. So yeah, all those things uh, uh, build in. But one way or another, they had to be curious enough to yeah. to use it, and we have to think they like. So the advantages: light from the fire. Yes, yes, exactly. All those things, and all that came naturally and gradually, but it synergized onto a selective advantage, <laughs> you know, to be able to harness fire. Okay, good time for the break, and then we're going to go into some material culture and evidence uh, for uh, the stuff and a hypothesis of why that big leap from the 1550 cc's to the, uh, uh, from the 550 cc's to the 1000 cc's of uh, brain capacity. Okay, so I'm going to put this in pause for a moment. Yes, and be back in about 10, 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone. Now the second half is, uh, I shall, yes, recording again. Thank you. Yes, like the recording. Thanks again. Yes. So this will be a little shorter, but just to recap, we have this um, fossil record evidence of the um, Homo line developing from uh, skulls that have been found and fragments of skulls and reconstructions. Now we're going to look a little bit at the more, what we could call the behavioral characteristics, because we're going to look at what is known as uh, material culture. Material culture is anything that we leave behind. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a whole science uh, uh, of schetology. Schetology is uh, the science of analyzing waste, the waste of uh, uh, other cultures and civilizations to figure out from the waste uh, how they lived and uh, what things they did. One main line of evidence is making tools, not just using a tool, but actually making a tool, which requires a uh, higher uh, brain, uh, we assume higher brain capacity and uh, uh, just more reflecting on the use of tools to actually make a tool. And the first tools were made, these clovis uh, stones, right? I think they're called clovis. which is essentially excuse me, trying to get rid of the italics. <laughs> Sharp edge stones to cut, to hunt, and to, to be used in daily life. These have been found dating back to two and a half million years ago, uh, of course, in Africa, and, and therefore, and with Australopithecus, Australopithecines. So it's before the break of Australopithecus and Homo, all right? This goes back to the tribe of Hominin. So the Hominin tribe already had not only the use of tools, but making some primitive tools. 
Also, the use of fire can be traced back to about a million years ago. So far, this is the evidence that has been found. Maybe tomorrow, uh, some evidence is found that goes further back. But so far, this is what has been found. Uh, there's a cave in Africa, in South Africa, that has remnants of a fire, which is thought to be a harness fire, a, uh, a, like a campfire. Okay, And this is a microscopic uh, section of that campfire, some charred wood that according to the experts is has a structural characteristic this chart wood of a campfire type temperature as opposed to a wildfire type temperature which would be more intense mm -hmm. a wildfire or lightning would be more intense and th the wood burns differently right so this is imagine the level of sophistication of detail that they're looking at the structural uh, piece that is left, a piece of uh, charcoal. They can tell that the temperature to make that structure, that would turn into that type of structure, was more akin with a campfire temperature than with a wildfire. Yeah, and that's dated back to about a million years ago in this uh, cave, Wonder Work Cave in South Africa. And so it's estimated that uh, fire had some definite advantages, like you pointed out, for defense, warm, lighting, uh, cooking, very specially cooking, because that starts the digestion of the food, actually. When we cook food, we start the digestion, so we begin to uh, bring out the nutrients of that food to make it more accessible to be absorbed uh, in the intestines. Also, another line of evidence um, now on the HOMO line, definitely this is on the uh, HOMO uh, genius, is the burial, the burial of the dead. Okay, so far as we know, we're the only species that does that. And uh, these have been found. Well, there's some reference to elephants when uh, that they stick around for hours when the baby elephant dies, the mother is trying to get the baby elephant up again with the trunk until she finally gives up. There's evidence of that in dolphins, that the dolphin pushes the baby dolphin up to the, the calf, up to the surface for hours until she's literally exhausted and gives up. So it's some kind of behavior there to try to maintain, but it, that I think can be associated more with a survival uh, instinct than with an actual ritual of burying, of burying a dead, okay? And the implications of that, why would any uh, species bury their dead? Uh, the typical example in nature is that they walk away from the dead <laughs> and they just let nature take over and rot, be recycled. But there's like no concern necessarily for the dead. But in the human, yes, and this, the oldest uh, ritual burial that has been found so far is in Israel, in this cave. Mm, it's known as the Kwafes, Kwafse, Kwafse, uh, cave in Israel. It goes back to about 100 million years ago, which is not that long. Okay, we're already coinciding with Neanderthal then in, uh, in uh, Europe. This is the inside of the cave. A hundred thousand, a hundred thousand. Yeah, so this YA is years ago, a hundred thousand years ago. Yeah, a hundred thousand years ago. So it's fairly recent, it's well within the million years. The inside of the cave has an adult uh, skeleton and a child skeleton, and probably from the hip, <laughs> it's estimated this is a woman. So the likelihood that it's a mother and a child, why they got buried, under what circumstances, who buried them, you know, the rest of the clan, who knows. But they were buried uh, with a particular position and so forth. That was 
Yes, this is in, uh, yes, this is uh, Homo sapiens. This is Homo sapiens, and it's in the uh, in the Middle East region. So it's a transition region between Africa and, uh, and Europe. Neardental. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So now there's also evidence that Neanderthal also buried their dead. At least in this one particular instance, here is a burial, uh, uh, which is a Neanderthal skeleton, okay, in La Chapelle in France, and it's 50,000 years ago. So it's getting close to the time when they were uh, extinct finally. So it's, we can say it's later in the development of the Neanderthal, but it is uh, considered a burial site, not just that this fellow fell in there and uh, rotted away. He was actually placed there. I don't know if it's a male or a female, but it has some artifacts around it also, which is typical of a burial as opposed to an abandonment of a dead, of a corpse, when there is uh, artifacts that are found around it, material, part of what is known as material culture. Uh, there would be little pieces of uh, maybe pottery or hunting tools. Sometimes that's found in more recent uh, burials, but uh, herbs or some kind of uh, clothing that is left in the tomb, which points to some kind of ritual as opposed to just abandoning a corpse. Yes. Exactly. So that I'm just building a case here for the transition into the spiritual. All right. Because uh, one hypothesis is that burying the dead is because of a belief in an astral life, which can be mixed in with superstition and magic and everything else you want. But that basic belief in the afterlife is only in the homo line and definitely in homo sapiens because the earliest and most primitive humans that we have found uh, evidence, we already find evidence of ritual and which is associated with some kind of religiosity, some expression of an spirituality in the paintings in Altamira and other caves uh, throughout uh, the world. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see Neanderthal with, uh, with a burial site. And then uh, clothing I'll talk about in the next lecture, but that's another possible line of evidence of, of, a, of a moral conscience of an ethical conscious. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears here for a moment and give you a little bit of uh, background and hypothesis on how we develop bipedalism, how the hominin developed the bipedalism. Okay, and here is just two diagrams of the chimpanzee skeleton and the human skeleton. I think the chimpanzee is a little too big in my proportion, but because uh, the skull is almost as big as ours. <laughs> but what is shown here is the center of gravity, the center of gravity for the body. As you can see on the human is square down on the uh, hip and then through the hip displaced out to the legs. Okay, if we had, I think I should have one from the front also looking because basically you have this kind of a situation where the, the weight is coming down the spinal column onto the pelvis, and then the pelvis ridges to it down to the legs, but it's a very vertical disposition of the, the weight of the body, especially the upper body, right? From the hip up. Look at what a drastic difference in the chimp from the hip up. That upper body is totally displaced off center, all right, here would be like the gravitational center of the body, and it's totally off center. So it's definitely not falling on the hip, that's their anatomy, uh, which forces them to do what uh, I've mentioned before, it's called this knuckle walking, knuckle walking. Let's see if I get it right. Did I get knuckle spelling correct? You instead of O? 
Really? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that looks better. <laughs> you say, if you're not sure, write it out and look at it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so knuckle walking is what they do, which means that they can get on their hind legs for a period of time and run around a little bit, especially if they're being chased, but then they have to go down on their forward legs eventually because they get tired of carrying that upper body disproportionately. Mm -hmm. the, the hip doesn't tolerate it for a period of uh, prolonged, indefinite time. Whereas for us, yes, and this is at the hominin level, including uh, Lucy, meaning astrolopithecines. And there's also evidence of near the skeleton, there was a print, uh, a footprint, the Lucy, the famous Lucy footprint in the mud, which was preserved. So it's also a, an evidence, right? It's a fossil, is the printing, is the, uh, there, see, these things that were found. And it's definitely a bipedal gait mm -hmm. with the toe and so forth. Here is one that diver diverged from some other creature that went by it. <laughs> bipedal uh, in a particular direction, you know, directed. And the gait is a human-like uh, gait, meaning the step between one print and the next. The, the distance and the angle. Okay, so this characteristic, what is a hypothesis, the prevailing hypothesis for becoming bipedal is, didn't happen just because, uh, you know, uh, uh, ancestors of the apes wanted to walk on two legs and just free up the hands. No, it's actually a post facto, right? It has to be a reaction, if you will. It has to be a post facto adaptation to something that happened previously. And the prevailing theory is that what happened previously was a climatological change of which we are still experiencing today. Uh, I should flip the, these slides. Okay. This is a photograph today. This is an actual satellite photograph of Africa today and uh, the Arabic, Arabic Peninsula, Mediterranean Europe, etc. Middle East. Here, this is the Sahara and the Sahel at the edge here. And this, by little, little by little, is continuing for now. This desertification is continuing to move south. North is uh, as far as the Mediterranean, obviously, there's a little fringe here of um, vegetation, but it's pushing south into equatorial Africa. If you can see, uh, I tried to match it more or less. I guess it should move it a little further down. The equator is down here. I need to rearrange this slide a little bit to coincide with the equator. Right. But this is. Uh, known as uh, Equatorial Africa. Here is the Congo Basin. It's one of the two lungs of the world. The other one being the Amazon across the Atlantic in South America. And this is the, an estimation of what Africa looked like, the vegetation of Africa, about 14 million years ago. As you can see, much more lush green throughout the entire continent. Okay. And the desertification was just beginning over here at the coast with, uh, with the Atlantic. But also notice that the continent was not the same. What is inscribed here is a continent about 14 million years ago. And then the white line is a superimposition of today's uh, outline. You see the white outline here, for example, very significantly, the delta of the Nile. This is the River Nile. Lake Victoria over here, way down here. Okay, and the Nile that moves north and empties out into its delta here. So it's considered that the bulk of this 
extra land has come from deposition of the Nile Delta depositing sediment all the way up there and incurs, making an incursion, if you will, into the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the Mediterranean itself opened up when Africa uh, split here with uh, Iberia, with uh, Europe, and literally the Atlantic Ocean is estimated that the Atlantic Ocean poured into the whole of what is now the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, fascinating when we consider that, and that took several thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of years to do to fill up the Mediterranean. You can see a lot of land, uh, especially between Greece and uh, what is today Turkey, here the Aegean uh, Peninsula was filled in, all right. At any rate, the point here is the continuing desertification that has happened in Africa over the past uh, 10 to 15 million years, which implies something like this, a transition, at least like a three-step transition, beginning with the tropical rainforest, because it's just north of the equator, right? It's near the equator, and so we expect in a tropicalized uh, uh, world, tropical rainforest, which then with the drying out of the forest, will transition into what is known as a tree savanna. So you have a mixture of grassland and some trees that survive mostly the acacia trees. But there's a big loss of tree biodiversity, big loss of tree biodiversity, all right? And that is a whole ecosystem there because the, the most effective way to get around a tropical rainforest is by climbing, jumping, gripping, and grasping. So all four legs are engaged. And in fact, the fifth leg for the mammals is the tail. <laughs> That's also engaged for grasping around and moving around uh, in a tropical uh, rainforest. When it transitions to a savanna, because of a climatological change, there is a pressure to adapt or become extinct. In other words, the adaptedness that was being selected on here was to move out of the trees into the savanna. Okay, and the adaptations that were more successful in a savanna where these animals now had to flee from predators, like uh, typically the felines that had uh, evolved, uh, uh, the uh, lions and uh, cheetah and uh, all the all the uh, predators that are in the uh, savanna okay so it was a pressure for uh, moving faster <laughs> for running faster than the predator eventually the third transition the third stage which is the current one is the bush savanna where trees are not very tall and Typically, there are more bushes and anything else, so you can try to hide in there, but the lion, which there may be a lion here, uh, could get in there too, right? Because that's part of their habitat. So anyway, there is a pressure for uh, running, basically, for running. And it's estimated that that was one of the main incentives for going by pedal. Mm -hmm or for allowing that adaptedness to be more and more successful until the point that we became fully bipedal. So again, remember, there's no directiveness here. It's just chance. The animals that were more dexterous at uh, behaving that way, they, on, ch on average, they were able to uh, pass on that characteristic because it was a survival advantage, which at some point also meant a reproductive advantage. Okay, so that's a possible hypothesis for how uh, we developed uh, bipedalism, but it's, it remains a theory and it has to do with a tropicalization or desertification of the upper half of Africa, the northern part of Africa. Uh, pinching in to the, into the tropical rainforest on the other primates that were there. 
So we can say bottom line, uh, what is not disputed is that the genus Homo developed in Africa, started in Africa. Okay. So this, this tribe of the hominin and the split between the Australopithecines and the hominin, have, uh, the Homo genus uh, started in Africa. The controversy is how, what, what kind of radiation, where, uh, how do the genus disperse, uh, disperse out of Africa? Anywhere from as old as a million years ago to 200,000 years ago, which is essentially modern man. So if we take the lower number or the more recent number, 200,000 years ago, that's modern man. It would mean that all of those uh, ancestral species develop and evolved in Africa up to Homo sapiens. If we take the dispersal with the older date of a million years ago, then we can see the transition and there's more evidence for this older date simply because we find transition species, the other Homo species that I've been talking about, uh, outside of Africa, right? in Asia and in Europe. So there's more evidence, if you will, for an older uh, dispersal out of Africa for the Homo genus, the Homo genus. And here's a little map. What's the intuition? The intuition is along the coast, right? Following routes of, uh, that are more benevolent for acquiring food, and for the climate not as harsh when you're near the ocean, it's a more temperate climate and so forth. And there's, again, considering back then there was no industrial fishing or anything like that. There was no radar sonar fishing. So there was much more abundance of uh, marine life available for eating. And therefore the theory is that it developed along the Eastern coast of Africa radiating uh, south and north, starting from uh, central, south, uh, central equatorial Africa, which would be here, moving east and migrating north and south, because at that point when you're on the coast, you have nowhere to go but up and down the coast. The northern branch, if you will, continued along uh, the Arabic Peninsula, around the Arabic Peninsula, maybe there was a bridge here also between the Arab Peninsula and I think this is part of uh, uh, Ethiopia today, the, what is known as the Horn of Africa, this is the Horn of Africa. Continue along the coast down into India, this is India, subcontinent, and further down into Polynesia, not Polynesia, um, uh, Sumatra and uh, well, here's the, here's the, Vietnam Peninsula, Southeast Asia, Indonesia as well, sorry, Indonesia, this whole region. Again, look at the two maps, right? The brown or the tan color is the way the landmass was supposed to be about 65,000 years ago, not too far ago, the shoreline, 65,000 years ago. And then the brown outline is today's coastline. All right, today's coastline. So in general, the coastline has receded. Look at Australia significantly in the north, the south. There was a bridge, there was a land bridge between Australia and New Guinea uh, just under 70,000 years ago. Also, all of Southeast Asia was one huge peninsula back fairly recently. So that's a landmass, that's all walkable. Uh, here in um, East Asia, bordering with uh, what is uh, today China, the whole Korean Peninsula down into some of the, maybe this is the Japan archipelago. Mm -hmm. So there were connections of land that are not existent today. Also Northern Europe has recessed, uh, the landmass has recessed, receded. Uh, Northern Europe and the, the Northern Sea, the North Atlantic. 
so that greater land mass was available for an original migration route, especially going north from Africa on the east coast and then east into the Middle East, uh, into uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, and then the rest of Asia. So that's uh, basically the most plausible migration route of the Homo genus out of Africa into the rest of the world eventually. So several theories are still controversial. One has a single wave out of Africa. The other one has a multitude of waves. Um, the jury is still out on this. Uh, there's evidence for both. But uh, what is uh, known is that there is a gradual radiation from the fossil record, a more or less gradual radiation, starting from Africa, moving into the Middle East, Asia, eventually down to Australia, which then becomes kind of a bottleneck, right? Nowhere else to go. But then on the other side, Europe, certainly a lot into Europe population, and then also moving up to Northern Asia, into the Bering Straits, the, what are those islands? I think they're called the Kuril Islands or something like that on the Russian side, where is today Russia meeting with Alaska. Anyway, that's, that's the Bering Straits, right? Which we know has been iced over several times during glaciation, so that would create a land bridge or a walking bridge, uh, which was also migration routes for elk and animals like that, that would be easier, like herding kind of animals that were uh, being followed by the, um, by the herders, that group of uh, people is called the herders. They would, uh, these are semi-domesticated, not fully domesticated. They would basically just follow, uh, these uh, primitive humans would follow these herds of mammals, herbivore mammals that would stop periodically to feed and they were relatively easy to catch, right? And cook <laughs> with the fire they had harnessed. All right, so here's another map of migration routes with some dates, obviously starting in Africa 60 to 65,000 years ago into the Middle East and then radiating out there, possibly a bridge across the uh, uh, Horn of Africa into the Arabian Peninsula. This route, which is where it was established, colonizing all the way down to Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the area of Southeast Asia, moving up into big territories into Asia and Europe, and then across the Bering Straits there, uh, showing at least two different migrations, migration routes. Then coming down what is known as the Western Corridor or the Pacific Corridor on the front, on the on North America, you have all of the Rockies and the, the mountain range, the equivalent mountain range in, in what is today Canada and the Rockies here that make kind of a corridor along the Western, or along the, uh, the shoreline. Uh, then that goes into Mexico with the Sierra Madre Occidental <laughs> uh, on the western coast of Mexico and then it dies down into Central America. These were two separate continents, remember, that merged at some point. The equivalent, because these continents, these plates are pushing against the Pacific, you know, and they're buckling up, the equivalent uh, mountain range in South America to the Rockies over here, that equivalent is the Andes, exactly. The Andes that have permanent snow, and they also generate a corridor on the western coast, and in fact, there are a number of primitive sites there on the Atacama Desert and all that region of uh, Peru, Chile, what, what is today Peru and Chile and all that. So these are migrating routes, but this is much more recent, and definitely into uh, modern humans. Okay, so to recap overall, what we can say is that there is plenty of fossil record evidence and also phylogenetics, uh, meaning the percentage homology with other living species that the humans have also evolved. 
Okay, that's the first thing we have to establish. The human species, all likelihood, has also evolved. Now, over a period of time, relatively short period of time, uh, really to modern human, the past 200,000 years, which is very small in geologic time. Now, how to, uh, and that is being just honest with the fossil record and the, the scientific evidence, the molecular evidence that we have. How do we combine this with our faith and beliefs so that we are able to do justice also to the word of God and what we believe and what we have seen in primitive cultures, because I can tell you, this is something that I'll bring in next lecture. Um, every primitive culture that we found of humans, dating back thousands and thousands of years, uh, typically there has been some material culture, some evidence of ritual. Uh, but not just ritual, because animals have ritual. For example, there's mating rituals all over the place in animals, but religious rituals associated with magic and superstition and all that. But aside from the classical uh, mating rituals that are in nature and in, in other animals, excluding the human, you know, why these religious rituals? Unless there was some kind of belief in an afterlife. And could all these different cultures that came from so many different parts of the world be wrong and all establish or develop these rituals, religious rituals, to the point of being super elaborate. I'm not talking about modern religions. I'm talking about uh, even cultures like the, the Aztec and the Chichimeca and the, old, and the Mayas and then the, the Egyptians and you name it, every one of these cultures, Hindu, the Chinese dynasties back three, 4,000 years ago, uh, they all have these elaborate rituals of burial and incineration and in, 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 in Balsamar, uh, in Balsamar uh, to um, embalming the bodies, okay? So, and they emerge in every primitive culture that we see. And the common characteristic of all these primitive cultures in many different parts of the world is that we're all homo sapiens. <laughs> So it's pointing toward a metaphysical reality is what I want to say. Metaphysical reality that goes beyond what the senses can perceive or what we can measure, uh, which is the empirical world, okay? And so for homework, in addition to the little summary, uh, just look up mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. <laughs> hmm? Just uh, look up and read up a little bit on this, uh, mitochondrial Eve. It's interesting that here we have uh, a noun that is a religious noun, right? Adam and Eve that come from the Bible, especially from the Judeo-Christian tradition, which are also Muslims because they believe in Adam and Eve too. Uh, but then the adjective is a totally scientific adjective, the, the mitochondria, which are the energy factor, energy uh, organelles in a cell, and the Y chromosome, which is <laughs> the male chromosome that passes on the, the male sexual characteristics. Okay. So look it up a little bit, and uh, we'll talk about that next time, mm -hmm. which is, let's see, next time. Right, not next Saturday, because... We'll see you in a while, Father. Hey? In December. December. Yes. yes. Okay, December. yes, right. So, December 8th. Wow. Oh, yes. So, oh, yes, okay, right. Because next Saturday, I have that um, prison retreat. We were, we changed, we exchanged for the last Saturday, right? Then the following Saturday, of course, is the Thanksgiving weekend Saturday, so we're not meeting then. And then, Saturday after that, I'm actually giving class on transplants with the other group that is graduating in the healthcare bioethics. So you'll get that in a year from now. <laughs> and then finally, we land on to December 8th. Wow, the Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception. Yes, yes, this is Immaculate. Okay, so try to go to Mass, either the vigil or <laughs> later that day. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll have class then. And then one more after that to uh, wrap it up. So we so have, we have two, two more, classes right? two classes, two classes. Yes, the eighth and the fifteenth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
If uh, anyone is going to be absent, not to worry. We're going to look at the video. And at this point, there are plenty of uh, summaries done to figure out a grade from there. So uh, most likely, I'll not ask a, I will not ask a summary from, I typically don't ask a summary from the last class because basically oh. at that point, the course is over, <laughs> you know, and I have to put in grades and all that. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much once again, and uh, we'll see you on December 8th, God willing. Yes. I'm going to close here now.